like to begin this morning with a prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly God, we glorify you and praise you for the marvels of your creation, and especially for redemption through your Son, and through the presence of your Spirit who acts within us, begins every good deed, and leads us in faith to knowledge of you. We ask, O oh God, that you bless our time together, increase our intellect, so that we may come to a deeper appreciation of the mysteries of who you are. We ask that through our deliberations today, that we be blessed, blessed with the deepening of love and given that fervor to share this faith with one another. We pray to you as our Lord taught us. Our Father, Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever and ever. Amen. Good morning. My name is Father Mark Morozovic. I am the Dean of the School of the Theology and Religious Studies here at the Catholic University of America. And it's a great pleasure to be here with you this morning as your moderator on this first panel session as we look at faith and explore it a bit more completely. Our first session today is entitled Believing, Seeing, and Knowing the Mystery of God. I myself am a liturgist, so I, I have a specific bent on seeing and knowing and, and living this mystery of God in our lived prayer experience. As you might notice, I have this Ukrainian embroidery on. So in addition to being a Catholic, I'm a Ukrainian Catholic. So it's a, it's a whole little different side as we look at, as John Paul reminds us, about breathing through both lungs. So I have the joy of celebrating liturgy up here at Holy Family Ukrainian Catholic Church on Sundays, and then at St. Joseph at Seminary on the weekends. So that's just a little advertisement. If you want to experience the Catholic Byzantine rituals, just come right up the hill. We'd be glad to have you. So it's a, it's a great pleasure for me to serve as our moderator this morning and introduce our first speaker, Reverend Carlo Lorenzo Rossetti. Father Rossetti, ordained a priest of the Diocese of Rome in 1994, is currently the rector, re, rector of the Redemptoris Mater Seminary in Tirana, Albania. He has previously taught at the Pontifical Gregorian University, the Pontifical Athenaeum Regina Apostolorum, the Pontifical Lateran University and has served as a visiting professor to seminaries in Holland, Australia, Croatia, Zambia, China, Germany, as well as here in the United States, a true missionary. His writings include books on the concept of temple of God and the thought of origin and on the civilization of love and the Christian interpretation of history and numerous journal articles. Father Rossetti has been asked to develop the theme of this session under the title, Faith and Sacrifice. Faith as Sacrifice. Welcome, Father Rossetti. Thank you so much. Uh, first of all, I want to thank especially my former student Paolo Prosperi, who reminded his old professor at the later university. Thank you so much for inviting me here. Uh, so as you heard, since a while I am missionary in, uh, missionary in Albania, which is really a poor country of Europe. And since Pope Francis has invited us to go to the peripheries, I, am, I obeyed before the time. And, uh, but <clears throat> so, uh, I keep uh, studying and teaching a little bit theology, so, but the, the theology that you will hear is more apostolic than academic, so you will forgive me for some lack of uh, scholarship or 
academic flavor. Uh, my topic really, uh, it was, uh, the title was a little bit larger than this on sacrifice. Uh, it was also on justice. Um, and uh, I gave like a title, maybe you have a little sheet of paper, um, the journey of faith uh, to believe in the justice of the cross, to Jesus Christ as the alpha and omega of our faith. So I'll try to explain the Christocentric aspect of our faith. And uh, I'll start by um, a quotation from Lumen Fidei, which is, according to me, very significant. It's in number 17 of Lumen Fidei. Jesus himself is worthy of faith, not only because he has loved us even unto death, but also in reason of his divine sonship, precisely because Jesus is the Son, because he is absolutely grounded in the Father, he was able to conquer death and make the fullness of life shine forth. End of quotation. So Jesus Christ is the center of our faith and he is worthy to be believed in because of his love, but this love is grounded in his sonship. And the last consequence of his love is the communication of fullness of life. And I was very glad to read that because in the previous book that I um, published, I got like a Christological synthesis, I would say, also uh, can be fruitful in a pastoral sense, is that... Uh, why is Christ the truth? And I think that we can synthesize saying that he is the Son, the Holy, and the Glorious. And he is the truth of man, of human being, because he is such. He is Son, Holy, and Glorious. And I will not be really myself if I'm not Son, filial, Holy, in love, and glorious in resurrection. My truth will be in the very moment when I will be totally son or daughter, uh, holy in love, and resurrect, resurrect a reason up in the glory. And now, in this very moment that I am talking to you, this Christ, who is the truth, son, holy, and glorious, is alive is living and is powerful. And I will start by quoting this very famous sentence of the letter, so-called letter to the Hebrews. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, after <coughs> chapter 11, where the author has numbered all the witnesses of faith, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles us. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer, Archegos, and perfecter, Teleiotes, of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God and consider him who endured such a position from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. So what interests me is that Jesus is the pioneer or the initiator or the one who gives the arche, archegos, is the alpha of our faith and in the meanwhile he is the teleiotes, the one who gives the telos to faith. How can we understand that? And I propose to you to do like a meditation. It's more than an exegetical study on this, but it serves to, to me to, to propose you a synthesis on the journey of faith. It's an expression that you find in Benedict XVI, in the Porta Fide, and also Lumen Fide um, uses this uh, expression. The journey of faith, because faith is a journey, is uh, a dynamic. 
And you have also a little sketch here. Uh, Confucius said that uh, a picture uh, is better than hundreds of words. So you have a very simple, the scholastic will uh, recognize the exitus and reditus movement, but I think that we can use this. And actually, my paper will be an explanation of this. I said that Christ is alive, and Christ is the one who has overcome death and sin, and who is right now uh, enjoying the power, and the power is the power to aggregate to himself humanity. And how does the Lord aggregate to him humanity? Through faith. And faith starts ordinarily through some signs of faith that we can receive. I say ordinarily because you can be, uh, usually as with Jewish people, that the Lord does that, as St. Paul. But if you remember, in Italy, it's quite famous, Eugenio Zolli uh, was Israel Zoller, was the rabbi in chief in Rome, and Jesus Christ himself appeared in in the synagogue, and he was like uh, obliged to, uh, in a certain sense, as Paul. But normally, the Lord does not use this extraordinary uh, means to call us to faith. The usual ordinary means are the signs of the presence of Christ in the world, which is the body, his body, his mysterical body, his uh, sacramental body, which is the church. And the church gives some signs of faith, which are basically three, in my opinion. Uh, extraordinary peace, uh, totally free love, and divine unity. Peace, love, and unity. Peace, I mean, is the testimony that death has no more power on you. And you can show this usually in very dramatic situations. When death or illness uh, pierces your life and cut your life and struck you, but in those very moments, the strength of faith gives you a supernatural peace. Uh, those among you who listen, understand Italian, please go and check also on Google the witness of Enrico Petrillo, uh, who is the, the, the husband of Chiara Corbella. And Chiara Corbella is a young mom who died after two pregnancies, uh, who led to a just-born child. And in both cases, the children died, but they accepted it. And the third pregnancy was fantastic. Francesco uh, is good was very healthy, but she got uh, cancer. And she refused the therapy in order to, to leave the, the pregnancy to, to go on. And after some months after the, the, the birth of Francesco, she died. But what is fantastic is this faith which gives us a supernatural peace and even joy. First sign. The second sign, you know, uh, Jesus says, uh, love you each other, and as I loved you. And the love, the total gracious love, is the sign of resurrection. And the third sign, of course, is unity, which is also the fruit of love. But the other very normal uh, beginning of faith is preaching, is kerygma, is this moria, this foolishness of preaching. It pleased to God to transmit faith, which is the saving, saving strength, through this very simple way, which is a preaching, a communication, oral communication. And that's why in Roman chapter 10, you have this like a phenomenology of faith. How will they believe if they do not listen to? And how would they listen if there is no preaching? And how would they preach if they are not sent? So there is the missionary church, which is at the beginning of faith. And what happens 
when we receive the preaching, the kerygma, the good news, that God loves us totally freely. There is the quotation of Romans 5 that we can remind. When we were sinners, God loved us and forgave us. And this is the very point, the absolute initiative and forgiving initiative of God. And when I receive this announcement, which also calls me to a new life, because it's true that God loves us as we are, but God loves us also in order that we become as he wants. Uh, Tales quali futuri sumus. In order that we can enter in his project, in the truth. The truth is the project of God, is the point of view of God. And if I adhere to this gratuitous love, to this vocation, divine vocation that I have, in this very moment, my heart may be struck, may be cut, and I experience the joy of the Spirit, uh, as uh, Paul says in First Thessalonians. Uh, the joy of the Spirit is something inside my heart which testifies me that the very words that I am listening to are the truth. Amen. I can affirm that this Jesus has died for me, is risen, and something inside of me affirms this. It, this is what Paul uh, calls the, uh, um, in 1 Corinthians 12, uh, 3, before speaking of the charism, about the charism, he says that nobody can witness, can announce that, confess that Jesus is the Lord, Kyrios, but under the moving of the Spirit. This interior witnessing of the Spirit uh, corresponds to the attraction that the Father does to Christ. You remember when at the end of the, um, during the discourse of the bread, John chapter 6, Jesus says, nobody comes to me if he's not attracted by the Father. Is the Father himself who moves us up to the Son. Is the Father that generates us through giving us to his Son. That's what happened Peter, to Peter when he was asked by the Lord, you, what do you say that I am? You are the Son of God. Blessed you, because it's, it's not your intelligence, your mind that said that, but it's my father that suggested it. So this witnessing of the father corresponds to this joy of the spirit, this witnessing of the spirit which arises faith. Um, in the Acts of the Apostles, you say, see the same thing with Lydia in Philippi. The first Philippians, Philippian Christian was a, a, a woman, Lydia, and uh, Luke says that the Lord opened her heart in order to accept faith. So we can say that the very beginning of faith is Christ preached, witnessed by the signs of faith and by the kerygma, and accepted by this interior witnessing of the Spirit, which is also the voice of the Father. You are my son. And he is my son, listen to him. This is the very beginning of faith. Uh, we can say that in this dimension, quoting Philippians uh, chapter 3, there is a quotation very interesting that uh, expresses the two moments of faith. The very first moment, the alpha, is the fact that Christ takes me up, that he... Uh, he makes me his own. And on the other side, when I will adhere to this faith, I will try to make Christ my own, to take Christ. And at this point, we believe in Christ. I say uh, that in the very first moment of faith, there is no need absolutely no need for good works. We have to be Pauline, Augustinian, even Lutheran 
in the first moment of faith. But only in the first. Afterwards, we have to convert. Uh, <laughs> and after baptism, is baptism, I would say, is the, the central point of faith. Baptism and Eucharist, the sacraments are totally united. Baptism is the grafting. We are grafted in Christ. We become one spirit with the Lord. And becoming one spirit with the Lord, we are united with him, and Christ is the life-giving spirit in us and dwells in us, is this divine indwelling of Christ through faith, is the spirit of Christ who makes me Christ present in, in me. And there, there is the metanoia, the transformation of mentality. We have the news of Christ, the mind of Christ, and Christ becomes really the um, animator of my spiritual, intellectual, bodily life. Uh, is the criterion of my judgments, is the measure of my hopes, is uh, the very model of my works. And in this point, which is, I repeat, sacramentally sealed by baptism and uh, Eucharist, uh, happens what Paul calls the, the fact that we become um, members of Christ, one body with him, and what John chapter five, 15 is the similar uh, issue, but with a different image. We are in the vineyard, we are the, how do you say? The branches in the vineyard, which is Christ. And in this moment, we receive the talents, we receive the spirit, we receive the graces. And we have to, to be fruitful. In this very moment starts the fecundity or the fruitfulness of Christ. We have accepted the justice of Christ. The first moment is accepting the justice of the cross. And what is the justice of the cross? The justice of the cross is that God has, with Jesus Christ, with his obedience, with his mercy, has purified us from all our sins, totally freely. He has done the atonement. And also another aspect of justice. In the cross happens this paradox, the turpissima mors, the absolutely shameful death becomes the sign of liberty, of freedom and of life and of true love. Mostly in Luke, in the Passion of Luke, chapter 23, we see that Jesus dying fulfills all the Torah, all the Shema Israel. The very last sentence of Jesus is total surrendering to the, to the Father. He loves the Father with all his heart, with all his mind. Into your heart, uh, hands, I commit my spirit. And on the other side, being crucified, he intercedes. He prays for his enemies. Forgive them. So in the cross is fulfilled the love to God and the love to, to the neighbor. And I accept that this is the justice, but when I adhere to Christ, when I receive his spirit, when I am grafted in him through baptism, when I communicate to his body and blood, his body of obedience, his blood of mercy, I can be confirmed to this justice. Firstly, I accept the justice, but afterwards I have to confirm myself I try to conform myself to this justice and to live in this obedience to the Father and love and mercy to the, to the others. And now is the starting point of a life in faith in Christ. And in this very topic, it uh, interested me that in Lumen Fidei, uh, number uh, 18 and 21, but also some other passages, uh, Pope Francis and also a little bit Pope Benedict, uh, say that, um, I quote just uh, 18, 
in the faith, Christ is not only the one we believe in, the greatest manifestation of God's love, but also the one we join with in order to believe. Faith not only looks at Jesus, but it looks from Jesus' point of view. With his eyes, it is a participation to his way, way to see. So when I adhere to Christ, I start to see the things as he does. And um, I think that is, this is the very um, magisterial integration of the best point of Pistis Christu, the faith of Jesus. Uh, you know that um, some conservative theologians do not um, approve this. We cannot speak of faith of Jesus because faith is a the theological faith is Jesus is the very center of faith. Jesus did not have faith because he, has, he had the vision and he's the, the object of faith. But here, uh, the magisterium does not pronounce itself uh, with uh, clarity about this topic, the faith of Jesus, but without um, talking about it, it leaves us to re recover the best, I think, um, issue of this debate. It means that Christ being the real just one, upright one, is the one who totally is devoted to the, to the Father, is the one who has accomplished the tzedakah, the justice. And the very core of tzedakah is emunah. Emunah is faith. We have to be a little bit more uh, Hebrew than Greek. Uh, in this topic, uh, and the amen of the Father is full of emunah, is the, the fullness of faithfulness, of uh, uprightness to the Father. And so uh, we are joined to him, and we enter in koinonia, the koinonia to you, the, the fellowship with Christ. And you see in Philippians uh, one twenty nine. Uh, not only you did believe in him, but now you can suffer for him. This is the passage. The, the beginning of faith, we, we believe in him. Afterwards, Jesus aggregates us even to his mission, which is to redeem the world. And Jesus is in agony until the end of the world. Jesus is in agony up to the ends of the world. The famous sentence of Pascal. And we share in this. I complete in myself what is lacking in the passion of Christ. It means I am his member, I is, uh, and I share, I partake this. And in this case, we have to talk, to speak about the imit imitatio Christi, of course. Eh? And you see that now we can join Paul and James, Luther and Trento. Eh? I, I repeat, we have to be Lutheran up to the baptism totally free, gracious. But afterwards, we are, uh, we got a, 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 a liberated freedom. And with this liberated freedom, we can work. But the works are not the works of the law, not the works of the, the flesh, but are the works of the faith. Is a faith working through charity. Eh? Dia di agapis energumene is the faith which um, operates. And faith, Lumen Fide stresses this topic, enlarges our eye. I'm not alone. Christ is in me, and Christ is with the Father, and Christ is living for all humankind. And Christ also, faith is the memoria. First of all, faith is memoria passionis, memoria pasque. And, uh, uh, but faith is not only a remembrance, but also faith opens itself to the future. And faith which looks up to the future is hope. Uh, faith gives me the certainty that evil was overcome, that sin was forgiven, that death is overcome, but hope gives me the desire that this very victory be total, be fulfilled. And 
finally, uh, faith is animated by love and expresses in love, in the present. I would say, recovering this image of uh, Peggy, Charles Peggy, this French poet that I think you know, uh, he got this fantastic image of the three sisters and the, 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 the faith, charity, and the little hope that takes the two others by their hands and go where she wants. Um, but I would say that faith is, uh, is the one who looks in the past and who sanctifies our past because she looks at the Calvary, she looks at the Golgotha, she looks at the Holy Sepulcher and gives us this cry of faith, which is, Jesus is risen. Hallelujah, that's the, 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 the cry of faith. Hope is, at the end, is only one man. Faith does not exist. It exists in the person that believes. But uh, uh, faith, looking in the future, as the, 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 and cries, Maranatha, come, O Lord. This is the pneumatological aspect of hope. And faith, who, which uh, is sensitive to the present, is really uh, the most important and is the one who associated totally with Christ. One spirit with Christ can cry with the very words of Christ, Abba, Father. And this Abba, Father, is the cry of love love to the Father, to self-commitment, to obedience to the Father, and the cry of mercy, the cry of intercession for the others. So I uh, think that we can conclude with two um, reflections. The first is the relationship between faith and works, and a little bit I said something about that. And the last one is faith and uh, worship to the Father, because we were accused by some Eastern uh, authors, theologians, that we are Christomonistic. The question is, is we consider Christ, the archegos teleiotes, the alpha and omega of our faith. Are we not uh, risking the Christomonism? It means only Christ, uh, forgetting the two other divine persons. And uh, well, for the first issue, faith and works, I just uh, remember one sentence of Pope Benedict, um, his marvelous magisterium, in one of his last uh, messages. Uh, he said that we have to affirm a priority of faith, but a primacy of charity. And both are absolutely inseparable. Um, Christian life starts by faith because faith is the knowledge of the love that, God's ha that God has for me. The cross is the forgiveness that God gives to me. And so only if I have known the love of God, I can give love. And, but there is a primacy of love. It means that if my faith will not be a concrete, a very real, uh, dynamic, active faith, my faith really is dead, as St. James says. Uh, in this issue, I, uh, and in this document um, is the message for Lenten of this year, the year of faith, uh, the Pope quotes a very beautiful uh, sentence of St. Paul, Ephesians 2, 8 to 10, uh, which uh, St. Paul says that we are really a work of God and everything comes from him by faith, by grace. We are generated, we are created by him. We are saved through faith. But the the issue or the, the consequence of this salvation through faith is that we may walk in the path that he established for us and that we can fulfill, we may fulfill 
the works that God prepared so that we may walk in them. About the worship to the Father. Jesus is the Alpha and Omega of our faith, but Jesus is Alpha and Omega because he is the perfect Son, the perfect Holy One to the glory of the Father. And uh, affirming this Christocentrism is not uh, isolating, isolating Jesus, but, but we have to stress this dynamic aspect of Jesus. Jesus is relational, in total relation with the Father. And this relation, I think, we grasp in the best way in the Eucharist. Christ fulfills our faith, joining us to him in his surrendering to the Father, in his sacrifice to the Father, sacrifice of obedience. And we are called to join this priestly Christ. It means that, as Saint, um, Pope Benedict said, the Eucharistic action in itself is the Church's greatest act of worship. Is in the Eucharist the moment where we realize that Jesus fulfills in us faith and we are saved only if we partake, we participate to his filial offering of himself to the Father. We join to the slain and triumphant Lamb who is on the throne of, uh, in, in the heaven. I put you this image. is the last one that I am very fanatic on this iconography. Uh, it's exactly the same period of the crucifix of San, San Damiano, um, second half of 12th century. And you see the crucified Christ is a cross, but Jesus, who has the side pierced, he has the eyes wide open. He is really risen. It's a kerygma. It's not a, a picture of the Holy Friday. It's a kerygma of the risen, crucified uh, Lord. And we join to him every day in faith, but mostly in Eucharist. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you so much, Father Rossetti, for this stimulating discussion as we look at faith and try to understand it in its depth and the dynamism of who Christ is in our lives. We're going to hold our questions until we hear from our next presenter, Father Paolo Prosperi. Prosperi, known to many as an assistant professor of petrology and systematic theology here at the Pontifical John Paul II Institute for Studies and marriage and family. Prior to joining the Institute in 2011, Father taught in Rome and also in St. Petersburg and Moscow. Yana Gavario po Ruski. His work has focused on the nuptial dimension of the Paschal mystery, scriptural symbolism, and typological exegesis, and the theology of the Greek fathers. He is currently preparing his dissertation. Beyond the Word, Apophatism and Personalism in the Thought of Vladimir Lossky for publication. Father will be addressing the session's theme of seeing and believing in God, specifically in the Gospel of John. Well. Actually, there is a change of plan. I'm not speaking about the Gospel of John, so don't expect it. <laughs> I had three papers, so I had to chase, choose one. <laughs> no, the first thing I, I, I want also to, to, to thank you with all my heart, uh, my friend Lorenzo, who came, he's here with us. It's not an honor, but more, it's, it's, it's really a personal joy for me to be here uh, with him because I received so much from him and also what I communicate to my students in part, uh, I'm, I'm grateful to him because he communicated to me such a joy and uh, passion for, for, for the knowledge of God. So I'm, I'm very thankful. 
for this occasion. Um, okay, now entering into medias res. So I, I would like to start giving kind of the topic of what I'm going to talk about. And I can, um, and I can start from, from the time, I mean, telling you the way how the idea of this paper kind of was born uh, while I was reading this summer the, um, the Lumen Fidei. And it seems to me the title itself is very significant because it seems to me expresses one of the most important threads that, that uh, binds together uh, these encyclicals. So the, 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 the emphasis of the Pope, it seems to me, is precisely faith is not opposed to seeing and to knowledge. Faith is a form of knowledge. Uh, the way how I want to, to face this, this unity between, between faith uh, and knowledge, or faith and seeing, faith and vision, so faith is a light, lumen fide, light of faith, is a kind of the flip side or the reversal. Not only faith is light, but, but so, so faith is not opposed to vision, but also vision is not opposed to faith. Uh, and, uh, and I will try to, to speak about this. I know that the, the claim is a kind of bold, but um, because the issue I want to face is the relationship between faith and, uh, and uh, believing and seeing in, in the eschatology, in, the, in, the, in our glory. So I start then. Um, if we compare the definition of the act of faith we find in the verbum with the one of the dogmatic constitution of the first Vatican Council, we can help notice the fact that within a substantial continuity, a new emphasis emerges saying that faith is an obedience, I quote, by which man commits his whole self, his whole self, freely to God, homo se totum, se totum libere committed, the verbum retranslates the Vatican first definition of the act of faith in such a way that the element of personal trust, what, what uh, Father Lorenzo called the, emun, the biblical emuna, of the Old Testament, the personal trust, faithfulness of a person to another, receives a new and more positive meaning. It is now understood not just as a due and reasonable act of submission to God, but rather in terms of an act of love, of a personal gift of oneself to another. This simple observation is the very ground of the main argument we will try to defend here. Our task is the following. To reconsider the relation between vision and faith in light of the fact that love, to refer here to St. John, especially in his first letter, O Theos Agape Estin, God is love, the God revealed through Jesus Christ. In light of the fact that love is revealed in Christ as what is the ultimate. The language of scriptures suggests that the ultimate end of the covenant of love between God and his people is not simply loving knowledge in the mode of possession, but rather, with a play of words, and my students know I like play of words, not loving knowledge, but rather knowing love in the mode of reciprocal belonging, the formula of the covenant. You shall be my people, you, will be, you shall be my people, and I shall be your God. And the Song of Songs echoes this formula. My beloved is mine, and I am his. If this is true, then the ecstatic dispossession of trust this is our main claim, must somehow, somehow, the, the difficulty is how, must somehow find a room in the very content of the life of glory, not less important than the restful possession of vision. Yesterday, you know, the, this association of vision with rest comes, uh, in, in, in the Western tradition, becomes primarily central because, because, of, because of the importance of the authority of Augustine, as we know. The Eastern tradition has an interestingly different understanding of eschatology. Uh, I would like to make clear, 
before entering into the heart of, of, of the argument, that the question at stake, far from being an idle speculation concerning the future life, that could be the first objection, is, in our opinion, indeed, on the contrary, crucial in order to render reason of the goodness and beauty of our present existential condition. This is a conviction that I matured more and more uh, along these years, that is, the way how we live our presence and our relationship with, with this world is profoundly and always unavoidably and unconscious, unconscious, unconsciously conditioned by the image of happiness that we have, of what beatitude is in our mind. Because this is what we pursue in the present. We know through, so we know through the veiling limits of space and time. These limits inevitably bind our knowledge to the interplay of seeing and not seeing. I don't see what is after and what is behind. I'm embodied in time and space. In order to fully affirm the goodness of earthly existence, we must therefore face this question. Is the twilight of this ineludible, ever-veiled and progressive way of knowing just in opposition to the perfect and fully joyful future? Or would instead possible to find a more generous way of conceiving the way in which our temporal condition prefigures the eternal glory? Only if what is beatific, joy giving, in the experience of the glory is not only the restful possession of seeing, but also and inseparably the movement of one's permanent being drawn out of oneself by the fragrance, to use an image of the Song of Songs, of the still ever untasted. Then the ineludible veil that endows our temporal condition can unfold together, for sure, with the aspect of trial and difficulty embedded in it that has to pass away, also a genuinely good and intrinsically beautiful value. So first point. The first point is movement and rest. That, that would be the, the, the first point of reflection. The tradition of the church, as is well known, and as I already said, associates the beatific vision to rest, as opposed to faith and hope, which are restless. Actually, the faith I'm going to speak about is especially the second that, that Lorenzo was speaking about. So there's the hope in faith, the faith that looks at the future, of course. Uh, for obvious reasons that will become clear. Uh, um, uh, as opposed to faith and hope, which are restless, this is the classical doctrine of, of Thomas, precisely because they long for the clear vision of what is still only believed and hoped. Cum ascensione cogitare. No? It's the definition of Augustine that then the scholastics appropriate. Cogitare means this thinking in search of a full grasp. Therefore, as we think, any Catholic theologian who seriously attempts to speak of a sort of perfected eschatological faith, as for example, von Balthasar, but already Irenaeus of, of Lyons did, mm? so second century, mm. needs first to face, to question the most important presupposition of the traditional of the traditional association of faith with imperfection. There is the, associ the association of movement or restlessness with imperfection. That's, that's to me the first point. Why should the trustful movement towards the still unseen necessarily entail imperfection? In other words, through a more effective language, the language of hope, of desire. Why does the yearning of eros, the passion, have to be necessarily linked to a lack. Of course, if faith and hope are defined with the classical scholastic tradition as restless and yearning because of a lack, there is no serious alternative left to Aquinas' inescapable argument against the permanence of faith and hope in heaven. The encyclical Benedictus Deus has established this already in the 14th century 
And already St. Paul, as was already said, makes thoroughly clear, 2 Corinthians, but also Romans 8, that between faith and hope, as we experience them in statu vie, that is, as, as bounds to the condition of affliction of our time, and the future light of, the, of glory, there is a relation of mutual exclusion. That is for sure. But if there is a different, analogical, and I emphasize analogical, way for conceiving the restless desire of hope and the correlative obscurity of faith, a way in which the restless movement toward the still unseen is not conceived in opposition to the rest of vision. In this case, we would attain an understanding of perfect knowledge that secures better the continuity between time and eternity and the genuine goodness of our finitude. In support of such a thesis, we can find at the very least two important footholds in the tradition of the church. There would be three, but the, the third is Thomas Aquinas, and it would be a lot of time to try to bring him to my side. So uh, uh, <laughs> maybe later. Uh, um, first foothold, the mysticism of the luminous or overluminous darkness dear to the three greatest masters of the Greek mysticism, Gregory of Nyssa, Dionysius the Areopagite, Maximus the Confessor. We could add Gregorius Palamas, but he's not Catholic. So to all these authors, in spite of the differences of their metaphysics, which are big, is common the distinction between two kinds of darkness. There is a darkness inferior to knowledge, what Gregory of Nyssa calls scotos, echoing actually in the Gospel of John, the, negative, the, the darkness in a negative sense. And a luminous over luminous darkness that instead characterizes the highest state of the union with God and indicates the excessive overabundance of the divine light rather than its lack. The word that Gregory uses is gnophos that is taken from the translation, the Greek translation of the Septuaginta of the Old Testament when, when Moses enters the, the, the cloud the, the, where, where God is and, and, and meets God. This is, is this gnophos, this smoke on the top of the Mount Sinai. According to Gregory of Nyssa, this perception of the excessive overabundance of God's mystery draws the beholding soul into a paradoxical new way of moving beyond, which is not opposed to the rest of possession. It is the famous mysticism of epectasis or endless progress that Cardinal Danielou described famously in the following way. Following way. With epectasis, it is taken from St. Paul, then we can talk about this, but with epectasis is meant precisely the state of possession and permanent aggression that characterizes the mystical life. Here, the opposition between knowledge and love between vision and desire, is overcome. To the intelligence, God is inside of the soul and dwells there. But to love, the soul is cast, is cast outside of itself toward his irreducible infinity. I quote a famous passage of Gregory of Nyssa from the life of Moses. This is, says Gregory, the most amazing, paradoxotaton, the most amazing of all things, when rest and movement come to coincide. Second foothold, the idea of a sort of permanent flowing of seeing into hearing, of smelling into tasting and vice versa, does not sound strange to all those who are familiar with one of the most authoritative doctrines of the spiritual tradition of the church, the doctrine of the spiritual senses developed by the church fathers, first of all, origin, but then many others, and then all the mystical doctors of the church, especially in the exegesis of the Song of Songs. The synesthetic interplay of the five senses with its power of creating a sort of fluent dynamic continuum between closeness and distance, union and separation, clear and obscure perception, possession and desire, 
is one of the most remarkable features of the poetic language of the Song of Songs, the biblical book that the tradition of the church considers to be the most mystical. So I ask, why should we have only a beatific vision and be deprived of a beatific hearing or, or smelling? My students know how I love <laughs> smelling. I have a big nose. Why should not be possible and even more fitting to say that the obscure light of faith is perfected in heaven not only as visible light, lumen fidei, but also as infallible, no? infallible power of trusting through not seeing. The imagery of the Song of Songs suggests as a possible way for keeping together the two things. The light of glory through a sort of spiritual synesthesia. Synesthesia, as you probably know, is, is not only a sickness, which is also that. No? Some people, strangely enough, this phenomenon hear sounds when, when they see things or you, 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 you smell a certain fragrance in correspondence with, with a certain sound, right? That, that's the phenomenon. But it's also, actually, it would be very interesting, for example, to study the use of synesthesia in Dante's paradise, not by chance. Anyway, uh, through a sort of spiritual synesthesia would be simultaneously light that gives the rest of evidence and word of promise or inebriating scent, song one third, that elicits in the beholder the de ecstatic desire to see and taste always, now I use the crucial word and the most problematic one, always more of the same, of the very same mystery of God. The difficulty is here to try to elucidate what this more can be about excluding a priori any quantitative understanding of it. What follows is an attempt to answer the question and to show that the just catched notion of restless rest or dispossessed possession is indeed truer to the biblical understanding of interpersonal knowledge than the classical opposition of rest and movement of light and darkness. So second point, Napshan analogy. First step, any reflection on the meaning of faith that wants to be faithful to biblical revelation needs place in it in its proper context, that is, the covenant of love between God and his people. Not by chance we gave so, such a great importance to the imagery of the song, because the Naptian analogy is the most important image through which scripture itself contemplates not only the dynamism of the covenant, of the covenant but also its end, Book of Revelation 2022. 20, Let us then take the most basic example, the nuptial vow. It is dear and, and known to the most of you. When a woman gets married, no matter how certain she is about the love and future faithfulness of her spouse, does not see in advance the way their relation will unfold. In this sense, any spousal vow is always and inescapably an act of faith and hope, or of hoping faith. That's why I said that that's the, the second kind of faith that I'm focusing on the most. Not less than an act of love. Now, it is also clear that the bride's not seeing yet the future's behavior of her spouse is not reducible to a pure lack of knowledge and therefore to a negative source of fear. Unfortunately, in our fallen condition, it is always also that. Mm? But this doesn't make, doesn't deny the point we are trying to make. It is also the space, also together, the space that allows her to perform an act of self-giving that precisely as such, that is as requiring a certain jump in the darkness, we can't help perceiving as luminous radiant, we could even say beautiful, glory, beauty, light of glory. The paradox here is that it is precisely the risky darkness of what's not seeing in advance that becomes a supremely luminous means through which she expresses something, what? Her love. I intentionally emphasize the adjective beautiful because beauty is inextricably bound, as we know, to form and light, species and lumen. 
ready from Plotinus. This is a standard understanding. The dazzling paradox is here that precisely the shapeless obscurity of, of the woman's not seeing seems here to collaborate to create the luminous form of the act of love. Why so? Next step. Next step, it's in, it enters more into a kind of biblical meditation. Uh, faith in God's faithfulness, faith in God's almightiness. This is the first step. In order to answer this question, we have to focus our attention on a simple and enormously important fact. Faith in both the Old, the Old and New Testament is not just focused faith as hoping faith, as trust in God's word. It's never focused just on God's faithful love, but rather and mainly on God's almighty faithful love. I mean, I have no time for making many examples, but the two greatest archetypes of faith in the Old and New Testament, Abraham and Mary of Nazareth, have this in common. Their faith is simultaneously faith in the Lord's faithfulness to his word, but also in the Lord's almighty power. For with God, literally translated, no word will be impossible to fulfill, says the Archangel Gabriel to Mary. The Lord's surpassing greatness, object of biblical faith, is the Lord's power of manifesting his faithfulness in an ever more wonderful ways that overcome any possible imagination of oneself. In this way, almightiness and faithfulness are not just to just oppose objects of faith, rather they are two dimensions of the same worshiping attitude. God's calling to believe in his faithfulness is a calling to recognize, so to speak, the immutable continuity or sameness of his love. His mercy endures forever, the Psalms repeat. God's calling to believe in his almightiness is rather a calling to honor in awe and reverence the inexhaustible ever greaterness of this mercy. Within the just described logic of the nuptial covenant of love between God and his people, the traditional oxymoric quality, oxymoron is luminous darkness is an oxymoron, an adjective associated to a contrastive name. Of faith as simultaneously luminous and obscure, restful and restless, acquires a new color. The aspect of light concerns once being steadfastly certain of the Lord's faithfulness to his word. The aspect of obscurity has a different object, namely the ever unexpected and unforeseeable ways how the Lord in his almightiness is able to express and reveal his love. As a, an always surprising answer to one's uh, self-abandonment in faith and hope. This distinction between love and its manifestations, or between what and how love is manifested, is decisive to understand why the abandonment of faith must somehow remain in the heavenly liturgy, as we claim, as both, uh, this is the next step, as both an act of recognition, and in this sense we could say of knowledge, and of worship, of love, of the supreme kind. So the next two points would, would be in which sense faith has to belong to the perfection of knowledge and in, in the other to the perfection of love, as, as honoring the other, as, as, as act of glorification of the other. I will first address the first aspect, hope in faith as ultimate form of knowledge, and then the second, hope in faith as ultimate form of worship, so fourth point would be faith and beauty. Faith and beauty, glory, beauty. The ever more character of love. Let us first go back to the example of the nuptial vow. The very fact that the woman does not know in advance how her bridegroom will unfold his love for her makes possible not only to show to him her faith in his future keeping his word, if this were the whole thing consists behind the veil of the present, 
Her not seeing yet would be relating to the future fulfillment of the promise, of the promise merely in terms of a passage from an imperfect possession, an obscure vision, to a perfect possession and clear vision. But this is not as any lover deeply certain of being reciprocated no by experience, the whole thing. Mix it with this negative meaning, there is in the veil of the woman's not seeing the future also something that we can't help perceiving as beautiful and good. Precisely this space makes possible for her to open in herself the space for being delighted by the surprise of a response to her trust and hope that surpasses all her expectations. As a matter of fact, the more a relationship of reciprocal love is stable, mature, and certain, the more the veil of the difference between present and future is experienced not so much as something bad, but as something delightful. The present becomes the, to use a liturgical expression, the iconostasis, dear to the, 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 the Eastern <laughs> liturgists. The iconostasis that images but also conceals be behind itself the inexhaustible richness, the ineffable richness of the free ways of the beloved himself first, and consequently of the free ways how the beloved can unfold his love in the future. In this case, the ungraspable mystery of the other's personal mystery, personal freedom, if seen together with the certainty of the other's love, if seen together, is perceived as a source of joy and not as a lack. Understood in this positive way, the obscurity of faith is nothing but the negative cipher or flip side of one's amazed and triumphant recognition that the beloved remains always irreducible to all his beautiful manifestations. You are more than I can grasp. Where this more does not indicate something previously hidden as not given, but rather indicates the mystery of the person itself and its consequent inexhaustible power to invent always new ways to say and sing the same already said and given thing, his love. We arrive in this way to the discovery of the not quantitative meaning of this evermore that according to many mystics, Saint John, from St. John of the Cross, for example, says, we will learn still in heaven. The doctor mysticus says this. Uh, um, that according to many mystics belongs to the life of glory. This more concerns the irreducibly free and personal character of love. The most important dogmatic theologians of the Greek tradition, the Cappadocian's fathers and Maximus the Confessor, use a very interesting term for defining the person in God. Tropos, which means mode or way. Tropos tes uparxeus, mode of subsistence. Or they use the, the term way in order to distinguish what in God belongs to the persons from what belongs to the essence. On the persons depends to use the language we already used, the how. On the nature depends the what. The what is always the same, love. But the how is different. Now, this difference between what and how strikingly fits with the interweaving of the twofold object of biblical faith. Ab Abraham and Mary know with certainty God's faithfulness to his word, to the logos of his love. But what they don't see in advance is the manifestation of the ever surpassing ways how the Lord in his irreducible mystery and freedom is able to unfold this love in time. Thus the analogy of friendship leads us to see that the obscure aspect of faith is not necessarily opposed to the perfection of knowledge, but it is rather true the opposite. If it is true that in love there is no fear, 1 John 4, 8, we can say that the more one knows God and God's love, the more one's faith in him becomes nothing but the negative flip side of one's positive recognition of the inexhaustible mystery of his triune freedom. In even more precise words, 
if in faith what is never seen once for all is the ever free how of love, we can say that this not seeing does not indicate a negative lack of knowledge, but rather the opposite, one's crystal clear and delighting awareness that the object of vision is not something, in essence, but someone who lives. This last affirmation needs and deserves to be better qualified. For qualifying in it, I will formulate a sort of biblical syllogism, so to speak. If the truth of agape is mainly to be measureless gift of oneself, first premise, and if a gift is as such an act of freedom, second premise, it follows, conclusion of the syllogism, that the gift is better manifested as personal gift there is in its gratuitous, free character, charis, grace, but also beauty. It's interesting, in Greek it means both. It's better manifest in its, in its free character if it is not just identical to what the receiver already expects and knows, to what is promised, but is in some respects different, excessive in respect to the expectation unforeseen. In eschatological terms, if the eternal gift of the glory that one enjoys were eternally just identical to itself and not also ever different, it would lose something of its essence, of its proper light, of its glory, of its charis, in the double Greek sense of grace and beauty. It would not express its gracious, ever the, the gracious, ever mysterious character of love as expression of the irreducible freedom of the persons. If this is correct, the two elements of possession or vision and dispossession or trust would come to show quite plainly not only their compatibleness, but even their mutual necessity. The blessed sees the essence of God as the tradition teaches. And yet, since the what object of this vision is absolute tripersonal -person, tri love, there has to be simultaneously the space for an ever new being drawn and called no, beauty, Dionysius says, talk along Calais with the play of words, beauty calls, draws, toward a, 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 a unveiled and veiled depth. Okay, so f called by the glorious beauty of the Lord toward the infinite, infinite depths of his ways, to quote St. Paul in the letter to the Ephesians, to him who by the power at work within us is able to do far more abundantly than all what we ask can ask and think, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus for all generations. Okay, so fifth point, for last point, two minutes. <laughs> Give me four, five. Nine. So admirable exchange, faith as fulfillment of God's yearning. This is the for, the, the, therefore the first answer to the question why the obscurity entailed in the act of faith is in certain respect luminous, because it is indeed an inner dimension of one's, okay, I already said this. But this is not the whole thing. If we now look for a moment at the picture we drew, not only from below, but also, so to speak, from above, from the point of view of God, hmm? that is, from the point of view of the, of the giver, of the ever greater giver, we come to realize something interesting. From this catalogical point of view, the ever new ecstatic movement beyond the already seen receives a new meaning. As response, of the blessed to God's calling word, that is to God's desire to bestow his gifts more and more. Faith and hope are not only receptive dispositions, but paradoxically enough, also and simultaneously generous and joy giving. It is precisely in the dynamic stepping beyond the already seen that the believer shows to the beloved Lord that he adores him as the one who is so rich in mercy that he's, a, he's more intensely thirsty to give than the creature is thirsty to receive. 
Charles Peggy has expressed this paradoxical giving power of unconditional faith and hope in the most powerful way through the image of the child, who is, ironically enough, the master of the house, not in spite, but because of his radical poverty and absolute reliance on the parents. He is the one who gives the greatest joy, who, is, who gives the most, who illuminates the house, precisely because through his radical, inexhaustible receptivity, he gives his parents the joy to bestow on him all the abundance of their love. And as a logion of Jesus recorded in the Acts of the Apostles says, there is more joy in giving than in receiving. And this is why the child becomes for Peggy paradoxically the one who knows better how to give joy because his pure space open to the gift of another. His pure happiness to receive everything from another. He is happy to depend on the generosity of his parents. Okay, so I'm sorry, I, I, can, I cannot finish. So it's... it's. <laughs> Sorry about that. Thank you very much, Father Paolo, for this wonderful, wonderful exposition as we went deep into this mystery of love and the relationship of the Father and the Son, and certainly with the Spirit. I could certainly go on for hours and listen to you, and I look forward to future conversations in this regard. Um, we'll have some time for questions and discussions. Uh, just to give you a minute, maybe, to put your own thoughts together, I, I thought I would um, open up both of our speakers today spoke about lumen fide, the light and faith, and both of you were looking at love and, and this relationship with Christ. Um, I, just, I just wondered if you could, you could open that up a little bit more for us. Um, certainly, uh, Father Lorenzo, as you mentioned, this beautiful icon of Christ crucified with his eyes open, and how this reaction to the unity of that paschal mystery really brings the believer forward. Perhaps if you could begin a, a, our discussion today by reflecting on that and maybe Father Paolo then going on a little bit further into that love in the light of that. Thank you, Mark, for this question. Uh, it's invitation to, to deepen just the uh, uh, iconographic mention that I did. Uh, well, I do love really those kind of pictures. Um, it's pre Giotto uh, art. It's not Byzantine. It's, I think, from a Syriac origin. And uh, you have in San Damiano, in center Italy, mostly. This comes from an island, Tremiti, uh, near... Uh, the southern Italy, an island. Why? Because really it's the Paschal mystery. Uh, this Jesus that you have crucified, this very Jesus, the Almighty God has risen. And uh, we have to propose, I think, also it's a challenge in our evangelization task, uh, to propose this unity of the Paschal mystery that... Uh, the one who has overcome sin on the cross has overcome death in resurrection. It's the same person, is the same thing, is the triumph of love, is the triumph of love on the cross against egotism, against cruelty, against uh, wickedness, and is the triumph of life in resurrection. And both has have to be absolutely uh, linked in an indissoluble way. So I think that's uh, even in an artistic, aesthetic point of view, we have to, to help our contemporary to, to grasp this uh, aspect of the mystery. I don't have much to add, but 
I mean, this is one of the things that we have in common, this love for, for, for iconography and in particular for, for uh, as, as my students know, I use the icons actually in the classes of Christology. I would just add uh, one little thing that um, it always strikes me that, okay, there is this, this evolution in the, as we know, in the Western tradition after uh, starting with Cimabue, there is this, this, this uh, first uh, em emphasis on the passion, so to say, the so-called Christus patience. And then this emphasis grows, become more and more stronger, and we have Grunenwald uh, at the end of, uh, in, in the 15th century, where Jesus is so disfigured that his divinity is not any more visible. And um, um, yeah, I think that uh, artistically speaking, the, the, the real challenge, as, as Ratzinger actually wrote in his book, The Spirit of Liturgy, is how to say what is genuinely valid in the Western parable, that is this emphasis on the reality of, 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 of Christ solidarity with us and therefore quod non assumitur non sanatur he's having really come uh, and to uh, uh, reach the bottom of this uh, identification with us with the fact that even on the cross you know, even on the cross even it has to remain visible the, f the, the, the beauties, the, the form, the splendor of his being the son of God. And, and this to me is, is the greatest challenge that, 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 that Christian art has to face uh, today. How, if you will, to keep together the symbolical depth of the Byzantine tradition and the, and the real, Realism is, is wrong because also the Byzantine is, is realistic. It's a different realism, but, but the emphasis on the historical, so to speak, dimension. And, uh, and it seems to me that, interestingly enough, the Gospels themselves uh, testify that, uh, not by chance, that you know, the, the centurion con converted that is believed precisely in front of the cross. Uh, and the same, the, the good thief. So, so the Gospels witness that even on the cross, in the very way, says Mark, right? He was dying. Seeing the way how he died, you know, he said, this was the Son of God. You know? this, this, again, the tropos, the way, the how, you know? it's the beauty. Uh, first, I would like to thank you both for, the, for very uh, stimulating uh, lectures. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to um, press you a bit, Father Paolo. Um, uh, I mean, this is a profound and obviously complicated question. Um, and it seems to me, I mean, I, I agree with the, the basic thesis, I mean, really unequivocally in in really in its root. But by that I mean um, uh, a unity of rest and movement, uh, faith as a perfection of knowledge. Um, I mean, I agree with Balthazar on that, and I think there is a way, uh, I mean, I, I think in a certain sense it's um, demanded by uh, even Aquinas, I mean, rightly understood. I mean, you, you can make that case. Um, my question is, uh, nonetheless, uh, how that's conceived seems to me extremely important. I mean, um, because it bears on every, as you implied or said, it bears uh, on every action already here and now. I mean, the nature of freedom, the nature of knowledge. Um, so what is my question? Um, uh, the, the, it seems to me the, it's the question of priority and the, even the language uh, that equates uh, rest and possession and knowledge and possession, um, that, that, that there's something there, there's a kind of paradox built into that. That is, so what am I, what am I getting at? Um, the, there's, it's the question of uh, the relative priority of rest and movement 
the relative uh, priority of wholeness and all at onceness and process. Um, uh, the nature of eternity and so forth. I mean, the, obviously these are profound questions, but if, if we could focus it then in terms of the nuptial vow, even there I agree with you, I mean, I, we would agree quite emphatically, the nuptial vow isn't a matter of simply moving from imperfection to perfection. But the question is, uh, what's the nature of the original perfection on these terms? And here, here's w w what it seems to me that we have to draw out there is the all at onceness that's implied in the wholeness and the rest and the contemplative that, uh, that's, that's implied at the outset. I mean, even so that it, it, it isn't simply a matter of, of process. In other words, completeness itself, we, we need a notion of completeness, which itself is really a completeness at the outset, which is nonetheless not static. Uh, and ultimately, eternity is not merely eternal process, it's an all-at-onceness. So that, that's my question. So I would say the, the way I would interpret this, this nuptial vow is that uh, there's an all-at-onceness and wholeness at the outset, which itself is inherently generous and open, open to the future. But you then have a kind of primacy of the contemplative, the language of possession is not really appropriate, even at the beginning, mm -hmm. but you have an all at onceness, and it seems to me that then that 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 reverberates back in terms of the nature of freedom and, and knowledge as such. Knowing is always a matter of uh, 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 of the re reception of a gift, and built into that is a generosity. So you see my point. Yeah. The, I, the I relative priority. Yes. No, I mean, so the, on the relative priority, I don't know, maybe, maybe then you can add something. I mean, what, what I would say, actually, with the help, I had the conversation with your son, so. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, so, um, yes, yes. Now, what I would say, I, I found help during a conversation with another colleague of, <laughs> with another colleague of ours that you know very well. The distinction between once for all and all at once. The two things, because I said, when I, I said once for all, I totally agree with you. And in fact, when I specified not quantitative terms, what I was, was trying to mean is, is precisely that in the, in the glory that is in the vision, all is given at once. But the paradox would be pro exactly that this, this all at once is not static, as, as, we, as we were saying. So it, it's a calling because the life of the Trinity, etc and the fruitful. Then I didn't make the last point, which is the point of fruitfulness. And fruitfulness speaks precisely about the fact that this dynamism no, is not the addition of something, but is the, the intrinsic dynamic of what is already there from, from, from the outset, right? Uh, um, what, I, I wanted to say something else, but now I, I don't remember. What was... Uh, I lost myself. Uh, I don't. Re I, I don't. Re do you want to add something? I, I, I don't know what it. I mean, I, I mean, I would go back and repeat some of the things I say. I don't know what you're. you're uh, you know, right. What you're anticipating. So, uh, um, no, no. I, 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 I don't understand what, why do you see, see a, a tension between what you said and and what I said. I don't. I don't see that. Ah, okay, possession. possession okay, yeah. so, uh, right. Okay. I mean, possession. to me, okay, the language of possession, be, be, I, I use the language of possession, I said this from the very beginning, because it's the language of the scripture in the end. So it's this reciprocal belonging. So belonging the, oh, is, is not, is st okay. Okay, yeah. It, the point is that we have to use some words. We are, yeah. we are speaking about s such a paradoxical th reality. Because, of course, at this point, if it's true or what I, what I try to, 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 to describe, we would change also from the outset, what does it mean to have, right? Uh, because, because of course we, right. we should overcome precisely the opposition between this possession and possession because, because d don't really make sense inside of this, in, inside of this dynamic, right? Yeah, I of mean. Of love, of receiving and giving. That's right. 
I mean, I have something utterly profoundly uh, as gift. And, that, and that, that already qualifies from the inside what we normally mean by have, at least in, in, right. in modern culture, having and possessing. I mean, it's but, same. But there's a real complete, anyway, we, yeah. we should. I mean, what I was reacting to is, is was a certain understanding of, of knowledge of as possession, as a static grasp, right? That, that that's was, was my intention. And therefore, it seems to me that the language of reciprocal belonging of the scripture is interesting because, of course, it allows for uh, maybe th there will be in the philosophical section, maybe there, there, there will be deepening about that, of course, to accept the truth is always already a, a giving one set to this truth, right? And therefore, the, the, the aspect of dispossession in the most basic philosophical act of affirmation is already there, no? So, um, but this point will be made by far better by someone else, I think, in the following sessions. Thank you for taking my question, which I would like to address to uh, Father Lorenzo. I'm very glad that you mentioned Pistis Christu, and I'm even more glad to hear that the Magisterium is open to uh, the translation uh, Faith of Christ, because I think uh, the grammatical evidence is absolutely overwhelming. It really means Faith of Christ. So the challenge to me is, I mean, I, I, don't, know, I don't know why there's a debate. The real challenge is to unfold and unpack the depth of the meaning of pistis Christu understood as faith or faithfulness of Christ. So my question is, do you see within academia, within the church, um, it, with, you know, within the broad, broader circles of Christianity, an appetite to go in this direction and unpack and unfold pistis Christu understood as faith, faithfulness of Christ? <clears throat> well, as I told, it's an opening, it's not uh, a ceiling from the magisterium of this topic, Pistis Christu, which is a Balthasarian issue, of course, and uh, arose a great debate in the Catholic Church, even in the path, uh, the, the Pontifical Academic Theology Review uh, of this year, there's a recent article of Cardinal Angelo Amato, uh, who again stresses on the not an opportunity of this uh, of this theme, he stressed um, the classical topic that Jesus had the beatific view, and so we cannot speak as such as faith of uh, Christ. And also, uh, Cardinal Vanois, great scholar, specialist on Saint Paul, letter to the Hebrews, um, would not uh, agree with this, as Saint Thomas and. Usually, I think Western tradition. I don't know well, but I don't think that in the Eastern tradition they will. So, so we have to respect tradition. I think, and I personally think that we have to do always an expl uh, explanatio terminorum. What do we mean by faith? Uh, as I said, faith does not exist. What exists is the believer. Okay. And now, if I speak of theological faith. In my opinion, the heart of theological faith is the object of theological faith is the Paschal mystery, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. In this sense, I would say that it's true that Jesus did not have this theological faith because he is the object, he's not the subject of faith. But if I consider faith in a wider way as the emuna, it means the obedience, the faithfulness, the righteousness toward God. Of course, he, he had this emuna, and uh, his emuna fulfilled in the uh, in, in love, in a sense. Uh, Jesus uh, is the one whom I believe, whom I hope is the object of my faith of my hope, but is the one in whom I love. 
I would say that faith and hope are Christocentric, rightly, when um, love is in Christ, theocentric and anthropocentric, uh, in this uh, sense. Uh, but uh, the openness that we have in Lumen Fidei is the fact that really there, and I was <laughs> thinking this this night, the uh, fides quae, fides qua. In a certain sense, adhering to Christ, it's the first moment of faith, accepting the just of the cross, uh, confessing that Jesus is the Lord, is the fides quae. Okay? But when I do this, when I convert, when the grace opens my heart, and I accept this, I am united in one spirit with the Lord, with Christ, in this very moment, Jesus becomes the subject of my theological life, of my, if you want to call this faith, this mature faith, okay, I would say faithful to tradition, to my love. It's a faith which becomes love. We have to be careful to not hypostasizing the theological virtues or not uh, okay, Claudel is very, um, Peggy is very uh, beautiful, but there are not three sisters, three distinct uh, virtues. It's the subject. And in the subject, uh, the very first moment is a Christological, Christocentric, and afterwards, really, I think that a mature faith is Jesus becomes, I would say that <clears throat> Jesus, while remaining the main object of the theological faith, becomes subject of our faith come to maturity as filial agape. And that would be my conclusion on this stuff. Father Lor oh, can we hear one more question? Just one more question. This will be the last question. He was already giving me the it's time, Father. <laughs> Father Rossetti, I'm wondering if we might also speak about a third moment of faith, which would be the giving of faith. So the believer in baptism um, is grafted into Christ, chooses Christ, conforms to Christ in the Eucharist. But then I think in the documents we see also, unless faith is, sh or faith must be shared to be strong, right? Totally, totally. So that's confirmation. Absolutely. But in this, uh, <laughs> this picture, you have like a cycle uh, and we start from the Ecclesia Mater Evangelizans, is the church mother, and afterwards we become sons, daughters of this church through faith, but afterwards we join the uh, Ecclesia Fraternitas Adorans, but this adoring fraternity, which is church, in the meanwhile will evermore be uh, evangelizing, um, evangelizing church. And so the circle continues and opens uh, all evermore. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Father Lorenzo and Father Paolo. It truly was a stimulating conversation, and I couldn't help but thinking of Paul's letters to the Ephesians when he describes Christ and the church as groom and bride. And that image of Christ as Holnimphios, who suffers and who binds himself so closely with us, reverberated so much in my mind. Thank you very much, and we should be back in about 15 minutes. <laughs>